Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. That's very nice to be here. It's a honor to receive these scientists from Senai Cimatec, Federal University of Bahia, Reconcavo, and Professor Jude. It's a pleasure to, to have you here with CI. So I'd like to invite to this round table Professor Dr. Karine. Please, Karine. Karine is professor of Federal University Reconcavo Baiano. Uh, professor Jude from Senior Lecturer from Ashton University, Birmingham, England. <laughs> professor Dr. José Luiz from Senai Cimatec. And Professor Dr. Silvio Vieira de Mello from Federal University of Bahia. The round table is about the field of future changes and opportunity. Each one has 20 minutes to talk about these topics. So after that, there is or there are some questions. So who is going to start? Karine? Yeah, let's. So, okay. Karine, you have 20 minutes. After that, I think that Professor Jude. Silvio? The last one? Okay. Professor José Luiz Monteiro. Oh, José Luiz Monteiro is from Copy. Sorry, I forgot. I'm nervous. Yeah. Karine, please. Thank you, Professor Luiz Fernando. Fernando Luiz. Okay, sorry. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here sharing with you guys uh, our work. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank to inviting me to be here. Okay. I will make a quick presentation today to share with you um, some parts of my work that I'm doing there at Astor University with Dr. Jude as my supervisor. Um, just to let you know, my name is Karine. I am associate professor at UFRB, Federal University of Reconcavo of the Bahia. I am professor of energy engineering department I was head of department there for six years. And for now, I am spending 15 months at Astor University to make a postdoc as a research fellow there. And I will share with you my, some results of my work, which is entitled here, Screening of Nickel and Platinum Catalysts for Reforming of glycerol into low carbon fuel gases. Yeah, okay. For summary, I make a presentation based on motivation, aim, materials and methods, some results and discussion, conclusions, and analyzements. So uh, the aim of this panel is to share some challenges as the fool of the future. And uh, in my opinion, the main goal of our objective here is sustainability. So we have some challenges uh, over the process to make some gaseous fuels. And uh, I will share with you uh, to discuss in this panel with all those colleagues uh, some points. Uh, first of all, in my opinion, feedstock uh, is a challenge. 
uh, why it's a challenge? Because we need to improve the gas yield uh, conversion of each reaction to make fuel. And uh, feedstock is the first objective to choose to make a good fuel. So, uh, which feedstocks better to produce some gas fuels? We need to know, we need to characterize it. We need, uh, for example, to make hydrogen. Which feedstock is better to make hydrogen? Which feedstock is better to make methane? And also, which feedstock is better to make both of them? So, uh, we need some uh, improvements in this area, in my opinion to get um, more efficiency of the production of oil gases. Second one, catalysts. Because in my work there at Aston University, we are making uh, gaseous fuels uh, with some nickel and platinum-based catalysts. Most of the catalysts used in literature, uh, using aqueous phase reforming from glycerol is based on platinum. And platinum catalysts are too expensive. For batch reactions using platinum catalyst, it's okay because we just use a little bit of amount for the solids. But uh, in case to scale up, how to do it, how to make it possible to do the, to do a viable process to make those fools. This is a challenge in my opinion. So what we are doing there, we are trying to mix platinum with other nickel based catalysts, which are most lower cost of the process. And third one, technology. How to make this process sustainable? This is another challenge, in my opinion. And next one is the scale-up of the process. If we do some batch reactions in laboratory scale, so we just need a little bit of amount of feedstock, of glycerol, or and of catalyst. But in scalability, if you want to make it possible to do in large scale, how to do that? So we need to discuss more about it, in my opinion. And we have been yesterday, me and Dr. Jude, at Simatec Park, and we are quite um, impressive with the infrastructure there. So maybe there could be possible to do those experiments to make this scalability possible, to test all the catalysts, to test all the feedstocks to produce so those uh, low carbon flow gases. Okay. So the big aim of my project is just like that test and understanding the selectivity and uh, of nickel and platinum based catalysts using hydrothermal process which is uh, reforming of glycerol to produce uh, gaseous fuels which are methane hydrogen and propane we also produce uh, co and co2 and for this, we have in Ebri a 100 mil uh, reactor that we make the reaction works with glycerol, water, and those catalysts. Uh, the main experimental method is based on this schematic, and we have the our reactor, and we insert the uh, glycerol, water, and catalyst. 
our time is fixed in one hour. And we have uh, three temperatures that we tested, 250, 300, and 350 degrees C. And after the reaction, we cool down, we collect the gas, and we do uh, the analysis and the chromatography, gas is for uh, GC, chromatography. We have uh, two, column, two columns in our chromatographer uh, to analyze the hydrocarbons and also the permanent gases. Um, the liquid and the solid, we take it out from the reactor. We do a vacuum filtration to separate them. And then uh, the catalyst recovered is dried at 105 degrees C for two hours in the oven. And then we analyze the solid to recover it uh, because we want to test it for four cycles and to see the conversion after the first reaction. Sorry, ju just to, to show you guys, uh, our catalysts uh, tested there. So we tested uh, four, uh, five types of fresh catalysts, which are nickel ferrite that we synthesized it there by combustion reaction, and uh, for other commercial catalysts, which are nickel copper on alumina, platinum silica, platinum on alumina, and PTC. After this first step of uh, reactions, we mixed uh, nickel-based with platinum-based catalysts, 50 percent uh, of amount. So in the first uh, reactions uh, using the fresh ones, we used with one gram of catalyst, and with the mixed catalysts, we used 0.5 gram each. Okay, so we had the same amount of catalyst in all of the experimental sector. And then we analyze the gas and we make the gasification, né? carbon gasification efficiency, and also the hydrogen gasification efficiency. Here we have um, some results. Uh, we already published it in a um, high factor impact uh, journal, published last week with Dr. Jude here, okay. So for this reason, I'm showing you guys this, uh, those results. Um, for, to show you how important it is to see the glycerol conversion and the gasification efficiency, uh, we got almost 100% of glycerol conversion using a platinum alumina alone and uh, PTC alone, but also sharing uh, and mixing or, or combining nickel ferrite and PTC, we got almost 100%. And nickel cooper with platinum alumina, almost 100%. And nickel cooper with platinum carbon, we, which are very good results. And, but also we need to uh, analyze the gas yields to see uh, which, which gas fuel is being produced more. So uh, we made it no? uh, in different uh, temperatures. These results here are for nickel ferrite. And we can see uh, the gas yield for methane, C2 to C4, hydrocarbons for hydrogen, for CO, for C2, and also for uh, carbon and hydrogen efficiency. So clearly, we can see that improving temperature, we got better results. Okay. In the same way, we made it for each fresh catalyst. And in each reaction, we can see always the same. 
improving temperature, we got more selectivity for each gas and also uh, efficiency. For platinum-based catalyst, we tested those three at uh, 350 degrees C. And we saw lower uh, conversions into gas yields using platinum silica. But we got good results uh, with a platinum alumina and also with platinum carbon. Okay, so after these first steps of um, reaction setup, we um, sit down, we discuss it each other to see how can we combine those catalysts uh, to compare the reactions uh, uh, results. And for the first time in the literature, as we know, uh, we combine it both nickel and platinum in the same reaction. Uh, and here we can see for the results for 250, for 300, and also for 350 degrees C, uh, mixing nickel cooper with um, platinum-based catalysts. And uh, also we got almost the same as in the alone catalyst used, we got better results improving temperature. Okay. Using uh, nickel ferrite combining with platinum catalysts, uh, we got uh, lower uh, gas yields and lower uh, hydrogen gas gasification efficiency. And the best results were for combining nickel ferrite with platinum carbon. But um, this reaction was not selectivity. There is no selectivity for hydrogen at 350. We also made one reuse reaction uh, with catalyst. We tested platinum on alumina in the same uh, reaction condition, uh, recycling it and reusing it to see uh, how it will be the gas yields and how it will be the glycerol conversion. So for that reaction, we got good results also uh, with 99.56% instead of 99.84% in the first reaction. So for the second reaction, the catalyst remained active. Okay. We didn't do any other reaction for the recovered catalysts because we are still working there, so we have too much work to do. And our next step is uh, test each recovered catalyst for four cycles to see. Um, conclusions. Uh, we can conclude here that hydrothermal reforming of glycerol at 350 degrees C showed the best results in terms of efficiency and gas yields to all fresh and combined catalysts tested. The best catalyst to obtain high glycerol conversion and selectivity towards fuel gas was the combination between nickel and platinum-based catalyst at 350 degrees C, as I said before. And the combined, this combined catalyst have good activity and selectivity for methane, hydrocarbon gases, carbon monoxide, and carbon uh, dioxide. Uh, gasification of hydrogen and carbon uh, efficiency as well. The PTC, platinum carbon, gave the highest hydrogen yield, but combining this catalyst with nickel copper on alumina, we also got uh, good results, which made the process more cost effect effective because we can reduce the amount of platinum in the reaction. And uh, 
got a good results uh, with this reaction. The recovered catalyst, we did XRD, and the patterns indicated that they could be active for more cycles, but we don't know yet. We didn't do more cycles so far. And um, the obtained results provided a good background for the synthesis of reformal of gas, water gas shift, and using multi-metallic catalysts and nanocatalyst for uh, the selectivity of fuel gases products. Uh, and we are still working on this project because our main goal is to use biomass to produce those catalysts. And for uh, so far, we are using poor glycerol. So we are optimizing the reaction to test the crude glycerol, which we got from our partner industry in UK. So uh, we are still optimizing the reaction to use uh, afterwards uh, the um, crude glycerol in the reaction. Okay, we have uh, this paper if you, you want to read afterwards. Um, our acknowledgement. So I'd like to thank the Marie Curie Fellowship, which is the fellow to I, I, that is funding my project. Aston University, Ebri, and UFRB. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Professor Karine. I thought that the interesting thing here because Silvio is my scientific son. So you are my scientific granddaughter. Oh, that's yeah. very interesting. <laughs> I'm very old. Professor Jude, that's your time. Thank you. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone, and um, thank you for introducing uh, me and for welcoming me to this panel. Uh, so I, I haven't got a presentation like um, Karini, and uh, we, I would like to talk to you about my opinion, about my thinking about the future of fuels. I think we are all very familiar with what's going on around the world about how we want to transition from fossil fuels to low carbon fuels, especially for uh, travel. Now, there are two main areas that everybody has been looking at. Hydrogen is one of those, and electric vehicles. So EV and hydrogen are the main uh, areas uh, people are looking at to decarbonize, to, uh, to make our travels, our fuels for the future greener. Of course, in this panel, I'm sure we will disagree, we will agree on these two uh, areas based on our experiences and how we feel. Of course, hydrogen is being put out there as the main fuel for the future. We now have different colors for hydrogen. It used to be colorless. Now we, we know it can be green, it can be gray, it can be blue. Um, we work on um, biohydrogen, and nobody has classified that yet. We don't know whether it's green or it's blue. Maybe we're going to have shades of green or shades of blue, in which case um, biomass can take one of those sh shades. But the most talked about hydrogen is the green hydrogen, which is the one that comes from electrolysis. Electrolysis of water using solar power or wind power to drive the electrolysis. And of course, um, we won't be here talking about how the solar panels are manufactured, if there are carbon emissions involved in those, uh, if there are carbon emissions involved in wind turbines. But at the point of use, hydrogen has no carbon emissions. And that is the attraction for most people. Uh, most of the scientists around the world, most of the business people around the world. So it is the only hydrogen that is green because it has no carbon emissions at the point of use and 
Also, during the production process, we don't know how much carbon uh, is involved. And then you have the gray carbon, which comes from the reforming of fossil methane. Now, it is the most uh, produced car uh, methane in the whole world. Uh, sorry, hydrogen in the whole world. Uh, we produce the most hydrogen, more than 50% from reforming of methane. We can do better, change it to blue hydrogen by capturing the carbon dioxide. Um, any source of carbon that produces hydrogen will always produce CO2. And therefore, capturing the CO2 is a way of making this um, better for the environment. Uh, again, how what we do with the CO2, uh, whether we sequester the CO2, whether we transform it into new chemicals, uh, that is also uh, a challenge that we are all facing. So there are this gray hydrogen being turned into blue hydrogen. And somewhere between this blue and green, biomass has to uh, be classified. Now, the, there are incentives driving whether we go blue or whether we uh, stay gray because the cost of carbon capture is also important. Um, I think it's the U.S. and the Middle East because of uh, cheap fossil fuels uh, in these regions are able to produce hydrogen from methane at a cost of about $1 per kg without carbon capture and storage. I think with carbon capture and storage, it goes up to nearly $2 per kg. So that is one of the penalties we have to pay in order to uh, reduce the, the carbon footprint of gray hydrogen and make it green. In comparison, green hydrogen is still very expensive. It's about $10 per kg, uh, as we know it now. Maybe with, with ongoing investments, because this is how we bring down the prices of, of products, or especially chemical products, uh, with investment, with research, we are able to um, get businesses to invest, um, increase the, the production per, uh, per plant, and therefore reduce the cost per unit. So hopefully that will be done in the next future, but at this moment it's still very expensive as we all know it. Um, we've done a recent study on biomass uh, to hydrogen using different technologies, including gasification, uh, AD to methane and reforming, uh, pyrolysis to gasification, um, and uh, one other technology we looked at. And we found that gasification remains one of the best options in terms of the price, the selling price, the minimum selling price of biomass, of hydrogen, which is uh, between four to about six dollars per kg. So that is why we think biomass has a strong contribution to make. And the work that um, Karini has been doing with me is a pointer to that, trying to develop new processes where we can make uh, hydrogen from biomass and make it cheaper. There are other low carbon fuels that we can think about. Ammonia is gaining attention. Um, as a fuel, there are low carbon fuels like biomethane, uh, biopropane, um, bio LPG that I have also been working uh, on, and uh, myself and Sivio, we've been discussing about that all afternoon because of our common interest in biopropane. Now, I just want to talk briefly about batteries. We, we know about electric vehicles and how they are growing in popularity. Um, again, the electric vehicles, the batteries are typically based on lithium ion technology. Lithium accounts for about 0.002% of the, of the planet. So maybe there's just enough 
lithium to power all the vehicles in the world. But coming from the UK, I know that there are about 33 million cars in the UK were registered. Uh, maybe some of them are not being used. But 33 million cars is a lot. And in terms of the uh, electric vehicles, uh, I think up to this year, there are about half a million electric vehicles in the UK registered. Uh, there are also hybrid ones. So in total, we're looking at about just around 1 million electric or hybrid vehicles in the UK. And that, are, that is out of 33 million. So again, there is growth. In, there's been growth in the next few, uh, last few years. But the, how it's going to catch up with the last uh, maybe 30, 31 million cars is left to be seen. Now, batteries, uh, there are a, a few issues that need to be uh, sorted. There's the range of anxiety in terms of you can fuel your car with liquid hydrocarbon, with benzene, as you call it here, and uh, it takes you 500 miles before you think about refueling. Electric vehicles, they have shorter range. Uh, maybe there is going to be, uh, there are research efforts to increase this range, but that range anxiety is, is an issue that needs to be dealt with. How to uh, make sure that it can go further and further, just like we have the uh, replacement uh, the cars we want to replace, or the technology we want to replace. There's also the issue of fast charging. Uh, electric vehicles, uh, if you go to a, a, a filling station with your petrol cars, you spend a few minutes, you fill up, and you drive away. Now, for electric vehicles, we need to think about how, how fast we can charge in order to make sure we replicate what we already have. The batteries themselves are not carbon neutral. The lithium ores that are used to where lithium is extracted from, they often occur in very hard rocks. And at the moment, the cost effective way of extracting lithium uh, is to use very high temperatures, around 800, 900 degrees Celsius. And only fossil fuels can cost effectively do that at the moment, you know, reach such temperatures for the extraction of, of lithium. And therefore, a car, a battery powered car, uh, the carbon emission is about 16 tons for a battery powered car. The annual saving of carbon from a battery powered car is around 4.6 tons. So it means that in about four, five years, or less than four years, uh, it may already have paid the penalty for the carbon uh, used in extracting the, the lithium. So there are those challenges, there's still carbon emission, uh, but how long do these batteries last? And when they, get to the end of life, how do we handle these batteries? Uh, can we recycle the lithium? Can we have a circular economy around these lithium batteries? So it's very, very important for us to think about um, all of this. Okay, so one of the challenges that I have um, to discuss with my colleagues here will be how we uh, use hydrogen and batteries together for the net zero that we want to achieve by 2050. The infrastructure to distribute hydrogen is going to be expensive as we know it. Um, we have infrastructure for the distribution of fossil fuels, but for hydrogen, this is going to be uh, a bit difficult. It might be, uh, more environmentally friendly to use green hydrogen, but how do we make sure that it reaches the consumers? How do we make sure that it reaches 
um, the developing countries. How do we distribute hydrogen in developing countries? I think that's what gives batteries some advantage because you can have a battery pack, assemble it, and export it to anywhere in the world, and people can use batteries uh, wherever they are. So that gives an advantage to, uh, to batteries over hydrogen because uh, there are safety issues associated with hydrogen. Um, it, uh, transporting hydrogen in pipelines requires specific materials. You can't use uh, stain, stainless steel or steels because of embrittlement by hydrogen. So you see, why hydrogen is being looked after, uh, is being uh, marketed as the future fuel, there are still a lot of challenges. And one of the studies by MIT uh, and some of their partners showed, showed that we will need about $150 trillion to transition to a hydrogen, a fully hydrogen economy. Where is that money going to come from? Who is going to pay for it? How does it pay for itself? Um, so hydrogen and batteries, very clear future for our uh, decarbonization, but there are still a lot of challenges. And I think for us on this panel and for the younger generation, these are the challenges for the future. We know what the answer is. Uh, we know what the answers are. But we need to find a route now from where we are to delivering these answers in a cost-effective manner, making sure that we're not just saying this for the West. We're not just saying this for the rich nations. We're saying this for the whole of humanity. And um, I mentioned earlier, we saw what happened in uh, COP26, when India decided not to ratify the agreement because they didn't feel they were yet at that point where they could stop using coal. Um, and of course, there are all, all the eventualities that can make this plan to uh, decarbonize by 2050 uh, become difficult. The war in Ukraine, for example, has thrown out a lot of difficulties. Uh, some nations are beginning to think about going back to coal because of lack of gas from Russia. So these are challenges that sometimes we make these predictions, uh, but reaching those goals can be quite difficult. And for us, the next 10, 20, 30 years, we will still be looking at different ways of achieving this uh, uh, goals, even though we think we know the answer now. So thank you very much for um, inviting me again, and I hope uh, we'll discuss this as we go along. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Judd. Now, Professor José Luiz Almeida. Thank you, Fernando. Uh, bom, I... I would like to thank you very much to be invited for excuse me okay to be invited for the eighth international symposium of innovation and technology thank you very much Lilian Fernando thank you very much it's a pleasure to be here okay I you present myself um, my name is Rosa Luiz and uh, I came from the petrochemical company okay I was responsible for the research area of uh, Sepsa Química department for more than 10 years. And after I came back to Brazil and uh, I was the general director of the Tank Química. And now I'm very happy to be here in Cimatec uh, to work in, and I am responsible for the uh, chemistry the market, chemistry market. Here we call chemistry market. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm going to tell you something about uh, what we are doing here in Cimatec about the sustainable decarbonization strategy for Bahia and Brazil, and we are working a little bit about, about this, okay? So, uh, let me do some contest of the, this history, né, about sustainable, sustainability. So, we need a, a, a lot of green power, okay? 
it means photovoltaic and uh, wind, wind power. And uh, we are working a little bit also uh, to use green hydrogen and uh, develop some e-fuels also uh, from Fischer Tropsch, you see, synthetic uh, paraffin kerosene from EFA also. We have studied a little bit about this, but now we are working a little bit with from ethanol, alcohol to jet and lignin to jet. Because to produce uh, the kerosene, jet one, we need uh, naphthenics, aromatics, but linear paraffins and branches. And uh, for the majority of synthetic fuels, we produce uh, paraffins and branches, but not naphthens and aromatics. But from lignin, we can produce naphthens and aromatics and you complete the jet fuel one. Okay, so this is what we are working a little bit also. And also we are re working and, uh, and to, to produce ammonia and hydrocarbons in methanol also from, uh, from electrolyzers, from hydrogen, from green hydrogen or, or sustainable hydrogen. Okay. So I'm going to tell you some history. We, Cimatec, some years ago, they produced the wind map from Bahia. Okay. And after uh, we develop, uh, we identify uh, the sites, the potential sites of uh, to produce uh, wind energy here in in Bahia, so it's very interesting because we have more than the more than 38, 308 gigawatts that we can produce here in Bahia onshore, onshore, and the the capacity factor here, Alexis here, you can confirm this is very very high here in Bahia. It's much more high. It's more we can reach 50, 60 percent of capacity factor, and uh, in medium we can reach 45, 38 of effect, capacity factor of the wind power here in in Brazil. Okay, in Brazil, in Bahia. So it's very interesting. You know? So we made also a solar map here. Okay, and what is the most interesting? That's the area to produce. Uh, uh, solar energy is almost the same uh, as the wind, wind power. So we can produce the hybrid park uh, generator here in Bahia. So it's very, very, very interesting to produce a green hydrogen or sustainable hydrogen. So we have a program here, and we divide a program in four, in four, in four uh, dimensions or four pillars. Uh. The first of all is now we sign a contract with the SEMA, Secretaria de Meio Ambiente, the Environment, the Environment Secretaria here in Brazil, to produce uh, a map of green hydrogen here. Considering some factors that I, I'm going to develop and explain to you in a little, in some, uh, in, a, in a few minutes. And also we are in contacting with uh, diverse sectors of the industry in Bahia, okay? for example, uh, steel, uh, oil and gas, um, everything, all the sectors uh, here to little by little to substitute the hydrogen from steam reforming okay, to the green hydrogen. But we have a very big challenger, the price of the green hydrogen. And so we are working very hard very hard in technology development just to decrease the price of the green hydrogen. This is the most challenger because subsidize the green hydrogen, I think that is not a very good option. And uh, because the society will pay for this. Okay, so it's not a very good. So we are working very hard in every parts of, uh, of, uh, of the, the technology in order to decrease uh, the price of this, the, the hydrogen. The third is the cluster of hydrogen that we are doing in the Cimatec Park here in the industrial pool of Camassari. And we, we finished the basic project and we are working little by little to have a, 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 a hub of hydrogen that I'm going to explain a little bit more. And the last one, the last part, I think that is most important is the 
center of competence, uh, the competence center that we have here, uh, and we are training people, high-level people, in green hydrogen. Fernando is, the, is helping us very much. He is uh, doing all the research with the, the students that we have here, uh, doctor degrees, master degree, and so on. And uh, he is working very hard with us to, to training people for in these subjects. Okay, oh, oh, sure. well, let me tell you something about the map. The map of hydrogen is to, uh, first of all, we, we are going to finish this, this, this map in the end of November, so in a few days. Okay? So we develop the state-of-art assessment for the green hydrogen programs in the world, okay? and uh, we mapping the main the potential areas to produce green hydrogen, and uh, we, we, we are using a mathematical model for this. We identify also the stakeholder, the, the of takers that can use the green hydrogen in this map, but we are considering also the disponibility of water that is very important in the, in the, in the, in the Bahia, the infrastructure to transmit the energy, the port, uh, everything that is the, infra the transport infrastructure. Okay. We are analyzing also the model tax of the Indo world and also the incentive that we can do to produce green hydrogen. So it's a complete map. It's a very, uh, it's a very interesting uh, project that we are going to finish in the end of November. Okay. So we are contacting a lot of sectors for example, chemical, petrochemical, oil and gas, uh, refinery, steel, mineration, okay, cement, and uh, a lot of them, just uh, as I'm telling you here, to produce, for example, ammonia from green hydrogen, capturing nitrogen, and CO2 also to produce urea, okay, and so, um, sulfate nitrate, nitrate de ammonia nitrate uh, ammonia and the sulfate of ammonia also from green hydrogen that are fertilizers, nit nitrogenous fertilizers. So we, we, I think that we can do this. And uh, we have a project, a very interesting project that we can offer ammonia below $500 per ton using green hydrogen. It's very competitive in the, mar in the world market. Less, a little bit less than $500 per ton of ammonia. It's very, very, very competitive. Okay. And we are also working very hard with the steel né, to use the hydrogen as um, uh, auxiliar reduction né, agent to transform the um, iron oxide and the chrome oxide to the steel. We cannot substitute the coke completely, the carbon completely, because the carbon is inside the steel. Yeah. So, but we can, I think that we can use also, using the direct iron reduction, the new technology, yeah, in some steps of the production of the iron. So we can introduce the hydrogen in order to substitute the carbon as a reduction agent, okay? And also in the refinery, for example, yeah, we have here steel, uh, hydrogen producing. The majority of the refineries, we produce the hydrogen from uh, steam reforming of methane. Okay? But for one kilo of hydrogen that we can produce, we produce almost nine kilos of CO2. Okay? So what we intend is in the hydrogen, is very, in almost a steps of the of the of the of the in almost all steps of the refinery we use hydrogen hydrocracking uh, isomerization everything you use hydrogen so little by little i think in this area from um, from the, our transition energy little by little we can substitute the hydrogen from steam reforming for it, uh, for the electrolysis Okay. First of all, we can use also the capture, né? carbon capture use and to uh, use in storage. Okay, and we have the blue hydrogen. We can classify as a blue hydrogen. Né? 
but in the after to substitute from the pen and alkaline electrolysis. Okay, and this is the the our hub of uh, of um, of, of uh, produce of green hydrogen in in the Cimatec Park. So, in this in this hub, we intend to develop né, the technology to produce hydrogen with a pen electrolyzer for a proton exchange membrane and also from an ionic membrane one megawatts from each one okay and we can uh, uh, increase the, the potentials of this until five megawatts for each technology okay now and we intend to just to investigate and develop technology to de to decrease the capex of the electrolyzers that is very high today okay to increase the efficiency of the electrolyzers and also to decrease to increase also the stability of the membrane and right, the nafion from the electrolyzer in the case of the pen of the pen so professor fernando is working very hard with this in the diffusion okay is working very deep in this right, to decrease just the capex and uh, increase right, the competitiveness competitivity of the hydrogen um, to face the hydrogen that's produced from uh, from steam reforming, and we are also working in storage and transport, and also in the uh, applicability of the hydrogen in mobility and also generally in the in the industrial chemistry. So in this hub, in the Cimatec Park, we have a lot of area and pilot plants. We are going to study all of this in order to increase the competitiveness of the 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 hydro, green hydrogen even working with the quality of the water also because if you work with the clean water for example that we have in the, in Cimatec Park we can enter the clean water directly to the ionizer right? it's very easy but it's a little bit yeah, expensive you know? but if you use wastewater we have to be, to do a pretreatment and if you use the seawater you have to 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 pay for this, and it's about, I think so, the Siemens told us that we have to pay for more or less $5 per kilo né, of, uh, no, excuse me, five kilowatts hora per kilo of uh, water that we produce. So it's additional cost that we have to do, okay? So in the, the, the most important, I think so, is the, to develop technology to decrease the price. And this is what we're doing with the center of competence, the competence center that we are working. Okay? We are studying very hard the bipolar plates, the diffusion of bipolar plates, that I'm going to show you. Okay? We divide in some parts. We are studying very hard in the diffusion of the bipolar plates. And now we are working very hard in the diffusion of the proton from the anodo to cathodo. We are working very hard in this, make a lot of, of work in this, and because this is the, the step that is uh, the, the, the low, the low step is exactly the, the diffusion of uh, the, the proton membrane. And also we are working very hard in the anodo, iridium and uh, ruthenium to develop low, um, less expensive electrodos, and also with the platina in cathodo, also. And the step, just in the, the, the reaction, oxidation and reduction, oxidation, the anode and the reduction, the reduction is a little bit lower, the velocity of reactions a little bit lower from the anode. So we are going to study, and the complete of the simulations. And we intend, now, Fernando, to put this, all these in the high seas, okay? <laughs> So it's a very good work that we intend to do also with the uh, with the competence center, and I think that it was this is what I, I have to present to you. Okay, thank you, Professor Zé Luiz. That's all right. Now, Professor Silvio Vieira de Mello. Okay, 
Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to thank the nice Matek for the invitation, especially Lillian. And it's a pleasure to share this round table with uh, so outstanding colleagues. Uh, and uh, as the last speaker, uh, I will, uh, of course, speak uh, less. Okay, uh, my, my speech is uh, more on uh, provocations than uh, to explain uh, what I think or my opinions. Huh? And uh, I start uh, with some uh, amendments uh, to the, the title of this, this round table. Not that it is wrong, but uh, I'd like to discuss not only uh, views from the future, but also uh, the present, because we are in an energy transition. So for an energy transition, we need a starting point and an end point. Huh? And there are a lot of challenges and opportunities along with this way. So, uh, uh, how long this energy transition uh, will be? Uh, where is another important point? Uh, we are in Brazil, but uh, for instance, uh, uh, Jude is in UK, or you can be uh, wherever. So, it depends on the, the country conditions, on the geopolitical uh, conditions, we can have uh, uh, different in dynamic scenarios. Huh? Now we're facing the Ukraine war uh, that uh, uh, has changed a lot of uh, the goals uh, of climate change. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, old uh, coal uh, power plants are uh, now working in, in, in Europe, uh, all nuclear power plants and so on. So even if you have uh, good uh, goals, even if you have uh, good possibilities, there is uh, always the uh, unpredictable, unpredictable situation that can uh, change your route. Huh? So energy transition is like a like a river. Huh? You you need to reach the the, the other bank but you don't know exactly at uh, what point uh, i'd like to to provoke uh, some discussion also about uh, decarbonization and uh, defossilization uh, i don't like uh, the, the term decarbonization because uh, effectively we we all are carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and uh, more, more atoms. Our uh, molecules are basically uh, made from these, these atoms. So decarbonization seems as if uh, we need to uh, put away carbon. It's not possible. So I think the, the, the best way is defossilization, because we need to uh, replace the uh, fossil uh, f foods, the fossil resources from renewable ones, and that is is the point. But it's not an easy an easy task because, uh, as you know, uh, currently we have a uh, production of uh, 90 uh, billion bars a day. No? Brazil has about five percent of this oil and gas production, so uh, you cannot uh, simply uh, replace all this amount of fossil fuels uh, uh, in a short term. And another point is uh, that is also related to, to the, the subject of this international symposium, uh, have a circularity in the in the subject is that nine percent of oil is used as a source of energy. I mean uh, combustion. Uh, so uh, we cannot uh, solve this problem 
uh, so easy. And only 10% is used as a raw material uh, for the chemical industry. Uh, for instance, as Luis talked about the chemical industries and the possibilities to use uh, green hydrogen. Uh, but we have a big problem, that is the, uh, the energy, uh, the energy issue. Uh. And another point is that uh, only the carbon dioxide utilization can make a, a, a difference if you have uh, the cycle closed. Uh, I mean, the carbon geocycle. Uh, in the way is the production of synthetic fuels, uh, because we need fuels to burn and so on. So uh, it's not possible uh, to do easy, to do it so easy uh, as uh, we'd like, as the nature do with the, the, the carbon cycle, photosynthesis, and so on. So we need a lot of technology to uh, advance. And I, th I, I think that one of the possibilities, because there is no uh, only there is no unique uh, solution, uh, is circular economy uh, associated with, for instance, CO2 capture. Uh, uh, the plastic industry is very keen about that. Uh, we have a lot of uh, uh, efforts, but uh, it's not an easy question. Uh, um, for instance, in Brazil, we, we are not able to, to recycle uh, a lot of uh, urban waste and uh, agricultural waste and so on. Huh? We, we are in Salvador, uh, a city of more than 3 million inhabitants, and uh, we, we don't have a, a solution for the urban waste né? or the best solution. Huh? Uh, so we, we have a lot to do. Huh? until you reach the low carbon or net zero carbon uh, emissions. Only to, only to give you a, a simple example uh, of carbon footprint. Uh, this is a, an electronic calculator that you can find in the internet. There are a lot. And this is a, some kind of exercise we, we we do with our students, né? Uh, because when we talk about uh, uh, carbon emissions in terms of tons, né? Uh, for many people this is a, a very far idea of what is happening, and it's important also to take in a, in a more uh, easy uh, way, like for instance the consumption of trees. Né? So uh, we have in in this example, uh, uh, that the habits of uh, students, uh, undergraduate students, um, not many rich habits, but uh, he consumes about six trees uh, per month. Uh, so when I talk about trees, it's more uh, easy to, to look around and, and see what we're doing with our planet. So, uh, Energy transition uh, uh, depends also uh, on not only net zero emissions, because it will be uh, a long way until you reach uh, this point, but also on low carbon emission. What can we do uh, to at the present, because the future will come, but it's not uh, here, and what we can do uh, until we reach the net zero emissions. Uh, so there are a lot of possibility of a lot of low carbon emissions that can uh, pave this way. Of course, uh, along with these uh, possibilities, uh, for instance, we can associate carbon capture uh, uh, with uh, utilization, conversion. Uh, so there are different uh, sources of CO2, uh, for instance, from bioethanol 
and production from oil and gas production uh, from biomass gasification and you can combine different routes uh, you can combine uh, different uh, technologies you can combine different catalysts as as Carini already uh, uh, pointed out and so on so we need to be open to the possibilities uh, we cannot uh, uh, bet uh, all our uh, effort in only one solution. Uh, it's like a, a lottery. Uh, you need to maximize uh, the possibility of our uh, bet. So, uh, we have been heard a lot about CO2 and, and and uh, hydrogen and, but uh, as uh, already told in this uh, round table uh, they are always together né? like a love store né? one depends on the other and even for uh, green hydrogen we cannot say that uh, there is no CO2 emission and uh, uh, of course that uh, uh, it's important to evaluate the life cycle of all possibilities, of all process, of all technologies. Uh, even if you are uh, using water, uh, you think that with water, we are not, uh, in many cases, uh, making a, a great impact, but depends on the the energy that you use to pump your water. So uh, it's a very uh, complex situation, and uh, many people uh, don't uh, don't see this this uh, or or cannot uh, uh, see this uh, complexity. Even the 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 politics, no? they they like to give uh, good uh, news, but uh, sometimes good news can have also a lot of disadvantages. So, as I, I told you, it's like a lottery to new fuels. Huh? We have a lot of possibilities. Huh? We need to explore these, these possibilities. We need researchers, as we have a lot of them here. Huh? But, unfortunately, not uh, all will win the lottery, yeah? uh, but this is not a, a completely bad news because uh, we will learn a lot during uh, this way. Yeah? I think this is a, a very important, uh, uh, how can I say, it? a very important uh, walk yeah? during the energy transition, yeah? and. Uh, a lot of science and technology will be developed that will be also applied in other different uh, areas. For instance, novel materials that will be uh, developed. So I'm very optimistic about the uh, energy transition. Uh, not everyone will be rich, will win the lottery, but Brazil has uh, great possibilities. Bahia has uh, wonderful possibilities to be a good player uh, in this in this game. Uh, finally, I, I'm, I'm finished my my presentation. Uh, I'd like uh, to highlight the role of science and technology in the energy transition. I will uh, recommend you uh, buy or get this, this book, a very recent book uh, about the blue economy. And Brazil has one of the longest coasts in the world. Uh, we have here the Atlantic Ocean, and uh, I think we can explore a lot about it. If you think that you have uh, oil and gas production in the uh, pre-south region, for instance, or in other areas of our coastal, 
and we have the possibilities of uh, wind uh, production offshore uh, and so on. Huh? So we can associate the blue economy with energy transition. So that's it. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And I'm open for questions to debate with our colleague. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Silvio. I'd like to ask the audience about any question. Nobody? Okay. Professor Diniz, Oscar. Excellent explanation and presentation from uh, the group. I would like to, to ah, I need to present myself. I'm Oscar Chamberlain. I'm a collaborator here in CIMATEC. And I have a few years working with uh, Fuse Energy. Uh, my question uh, to you is about the scenarios. We are, we are talking about hydrogen or uh, new uh, uh, reactions to produce hydrogen from glycerin, or question about the, is hydrogen a road for the future? So, and uh, Jose Luis, this is also related because you are studying Bahia, studying Brazil. What is the expectation in terms of scenario? Hydrogen will be uh, what part of energy in Brazil, in terms uh, of uh, the contribution for mobility, the contribution for industry? We are talking about 1%, less than 1%, or we have something more, uh, I would say, attractive for uh, 2050. May I, may I begin? Yes, that's for sure. Well, my, my expectation, I think that the energy transition is uh, inexorable, little by little, uh, because the economy is very important also. Okay? We cannot substitute, for example, gasoline and ethanol here in the cars immediately. Okay? But, for example, the electricity, the, the electrical car, uh, the F car, uh, they have a very heavy batteries, a very heavy batteries. So we are carrying a lot of weight you know, to transport. I think that uh, the uh, fuel cell for hydrogen, for example, it means you can feed with ethanol, we can feed with hydrogen, but the fuel cell, I think that's the, the future in the mobility for the cars, mainly for the heavy, have uh, transport, you know, trucks, trains, and so on. So uh, little by little, I think that uh, we are going to change. This is my expectation. This is my expectation, the, the, my way of, uh, of thinking. OK, um, thank you. I think um, I just um, support what you've just said. Um, in terms of the scenario, it has to be specific to the location or to the environment where you want to substitute hydrogen or any other source of uh, energy. Um, we have to be thinking about the resources to produce this energy, uh, whether they are readily available within the location, how we can transport this. Um, but I believe that for large uh, transportation uh, equipment la for large uh, trucks and ships that the battery technology is not going to be suitable not, at least not at this moment because of the weight uh, so hydrogen can replace uh, the heavy oils we use 
can replace the energy, uh, can be the energy source for those kind of transportation in the future. Whether this is going to be 50% or 100% is left to be seen because that, that is what uh, I believe Professor Sivio is trying to uh, talk about. Do we really want to be using decarbonization or do we want to defossilize? And I think that is where the scenarios can uh, be argued whether we will get to 10% hydrogen uh, replacement or displacement uh, or not. So if I understand your question correctly, there are different scenarios being painted, but I don't see in the next 10 years that we will achieve 10%. That is my personal opinion. Um, thank you for your question. Yeah, I am agree with both Professor Zaliz and Jude. Uh, and I, I would say that um, we can see some larger projects to produce hydrogen, but we can't uh, until now say uh, how it will be produced and when it will be able to use and how much it will cost. So those are questions that we need to answer and we need to work a lot to make it possible. And this is the main uh, uh, goal that we have now, I think, in my opinion. Okay, thank you. I think now is Professor Diniz make a question. Okay, uh, I'm Diniz, professor of the Cimatec. Uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, uh, I I like to you think uh, Jude uh, you did the other country uh, the solution of the future of the fuel. Uh, you think this solution is a one solution or uh, many solution uh, customized for the uh, each country, each area in the in the world? What do you think about this in in, in this, uh, Professor Silvio, Zé Luiz, and Karim? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um, I think this is the kind of question I also like to ask because. I don't believe there is one size fit all for this energy transition. Uh, we have to keep an open mind and look at the different channels and see how we can support each channel, uh, have a mix of energy resources, energy uh, carriers in order to meet this decarbonization and net zero. Um, I discussed uh, hydrogen and batteries, and I also mentioned there are a few, just like uh, my uh, colleagues here, a few low carbon uh, energy carriers that can be used. Um, it is a gradual process, I think. Um, there is always this disconnection between the technical scientists doing the experiment in the lab and the scientists who forecast what is going to happen in the future. Uh, they make very good assumptions, but these assumptions may not be already be optimized in the lab before they make these assumptions. And therefore we have this kind of scenario that by 2050, there is no more carbon to be burned. I personally think that it is a gradual process. We need to defossilize and then begin the process of decarbonization where possible. I think Brazil has a very unique uh, role to play in this whole uh, system we're discussing. I had a brief discussion with uh, Professor Silvio earlier. Uh, you have different climate conditions in Brazil. You have rain in some areas, you have winter in some areas, you have all the different seasons in, in some areas. And therefore, 
the different places you have in Brazil can be looked at as representing the whole world, and we can look at finding solutions, local solutions to these different areas. Maybe here in Bahia, it's the ocean uh, that will provide the energy, or it's the biomass. Uh, maybe somewhere in the Amazon, it's biomass, or it's the wind energy. So I think it's a combination of different sources of energy, uh, but it has to be, for it to be maybe cost effective and useful to the, to the community, we need to be looking at the resources present within a community and deploying these resources for energy, uh, for the energy transition. That's my opinion. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. I, I, I completely agree with uh, Jude. Uh, and I'd like also to add that uh, uh, in the case of Brazil, uh, uh, we have a big opportunity because we are uh, self-sustainable in oil and gas. Uh, and of course, we have a great potential for renewable energy, biomass, and so on. And I think that maybe uh, the energy transition uh, can be the maybe the the last opportunity uh, for Brazil in this in this century uh, to develop uh, also in terms of reducing the inequalities because we have a lot of social problems not only economic problems but social problems environmental problems and this is a a big opportunity so. I'm very optimistic né, that we can have uh, a good, a good, a very good uh, opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Denise, for your question. I think that our country is the luckiest country in the world in terms of uh, biomass feedstocks to produce biodiesel because we have an infinite biomass uh, kind to study here and we are so lucky for this. And as Dr. Jude presented to us yesterday, in UK, to produce energy, they buy plastics waste for abroad. They don't have waste enough to produce uh, energy. And we have too much biomass uh, uh, types here to produce uh, uh, energy. So uh, uh, we have uh, to use these opportunities to make it possible, to make it easy, to make, to make it uh, uh, cheaper. And we need to study more. So uh, I think that for this reason, we are both together here today. I'm in line with the, the thinking of uh, Jude uh, and Kat, Karin, Karin, and for so Silvio also. Because, for example, ethanol, uh, for the productions of ethanol, uh, ethanol is a very big opportunity for us. We can, ethanol, to, to to produce ethanol, we generate a lot of uh, organic material that we can work, produce uh, biomass. And from biomass, we can produce hydrogen or uh, methane. And with methane, we can produce hydrogen and so on. So we have a very big opportunity because the industry of ethanol is in Brazil now. Uh, we are producing a lot of ethanol here. And even from ethanol to hydrogen in a car, for example, using reform and also a uh, fuel cell, it's possible also. So the problem is decrease the cost of all this. And the scientists in Brazil and the worldwide are working very hard to be competitive with all of this. So in, the, in Bahia, for example, I, I, I like very much to speak about Bahia. Uh, and so we have an insulation very strong in Bahia. 
in the northwest of, of Bahia. And the uh, uh, wind power, very, very strong. Uh, 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 and uh, the energy here is, very, is not very expensive. For example, the photovoltaic energy now in, in, in Bahia is about $38 per kilowatt hour. So it's not very expensive comparing with uh, in Europe or in the United States. So it's, it's and the electricity is at the base né, for the electro, for the electrolyzers. So uh, we have a lot of opportunity here. And as Silvio talked, it's a very big opportunity for Brazil because we can, all the projects that we can attract from the world to here in Bahia is very important because we have a very difference in social here in Brazil. It's a very big opportunity for us to increase the quality of life of all Brazilian, mainly in Nordeste of Brazil, because here is, is a, it's a potential né, for the productions of hydrogen, for the biodiversity that we have here, and so on. So it's really a big opportunity. We cannot, uh, we cannot perder esse bonde. <laughs> Any more question from audience, please? <laughs> Which are the more attractive niche for hydrogen? Because uh, you said ethanol, you said biomass, you said we have renewables, but uh, need to start for the uh, small step so what is the niche more attractive in Brazil to use the hydrogen? Petrochemical, mining, what is the niche more attractive? May I? I think that's fertilizers, ammonia, the productions of ammonia. Because the energy is very important for the world, but uh, the food is very important for the world also. And the food is very related to fertilizers. Ammonium sulfate and uh, nitrate sulfate, uh, ammonium nitrate, uh, nitrate de ammonia, sulfate de ammonia, uh, ammonium sulfate and ammonium nitrate. It's, it's very important, and we also. So we can produce a lot of, for example, uh, I think that five gigawatts, we calculate a little bit, five gigawatts of clean energy can produce a little bit more than four million tons of ammonia. So it's very important for fertilizers. And we here in Brazil import 85% of the nitro fertilizers, nitrogen fertilizers. So it's a very big opportunity for us uh, to produce fertilizers and, uh, and food because we have a very, a very strong uh, uh, agro-industry. So it's a very big opportunity for us. So ammonia, I think, in my opinion, is the next, yeah, the best use of, uh, of the green hydrogen for the, the energy transition. Okay, I'm, even though I'm not from Brazil, I think I can also look at um, what, what I've seen since I uh, arrived. Um, in, in my uh, original submission, I, I mentioned that uh, the distribution, the way we can make hydrogen reach the population for transport is expensive. It's going to be expensive. Um, so if we want to make a start with hydrogen, we need to look for where we can use either the green hydrogen or blue hydrogen to replace the dirty hydrogen. So I think in ammonia production, in the steel industry that you mentioned, even in the refineries, there's a lot of hydrogen consumption. If the hydrogen comes from biomass or from um, uh, electrolysis, then we will already begin because these are easy to deploy uh, 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 scenarios. But of course, creating pipelines around Brazil or any other country to, to distribute hydrogen is not going to be something you do in a day, in a year. It will it's going to be a long-term project. 
but we need the hydrogen to begin to make contributions now, and therefore replacing hydrogen in hydrogen intensive industries, processes may be the way forward. Thank you. Thank you, Professor George Silvio. Uh, regarding green hydrogen, I'd like to add uh, only that uh, in Brazil we need to rethink uh, the way, uh, the, the only way uh, to produce green hydrogen uh, for exportation. Uh, many states in the Northeast region uh, are announced, oh, let's uh, produce a lot of hydrogen to export to Europe and so on. But I think that uh, in, in uh, medium and long term for Brazil uh, should be uh, more useful to use green hydrogen here, not to export. And it's better to export oil and gas, because if Brazil export oil and gas, uh, those countries that will import oil and gas should pay the carbon credits. So this should be uh, a double advantage for Brazil. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any question? One more, Rodrigo. So, I, I, though I arrived quite late for the presentation, I'm sorry for that, guys. Uh, may I miss the point where we need to scale up what we do in the lab? How you see the challenge in terms of cost and also opportunities when we scale up those technologies that we have already evaluate positively in the lab. I'm, I, I'm going to speak about the UK scenario here. Um, uh, probably you have exactly the same systems here. Uh, in the UK, the UK government has a number of organizations. Um, one of them is called Innovate UK. And then you have the Department for Business and Industry, Industrial Strategy. Um, and then you have Department for Transport. Now, these departments and organizations are uh, vehicles for the UK government to link research and industry in order to achieve this uh, uh, scale up that you talk about. And so there are some research institutes uh, that are designed in this way in the UK, where what you do is to take laboratory exper experiments and link up with industry for scale up. So, and this is what the UK is doing. Uh, maybe not because they have the resources, but the, because they can develop this technology and they can export this technology to other countries. Uh, but this is the way they see, and I think it's a very good way of moving from fundamental research gradually to scaling up, and they provide, provide the funding. So at the stage where you reach technology readiness levels five, six, seven, there's also the contribution from the industry. So it's not just the government or taxpayers' money. So there's a joint venture. Um, and there are also the, uh, the initiatives to help industries to decarbonize. For example, we work in Aston with the glass industry in, in the UK, and they've been getting funding and grants from the government to try and reduce the use of uh, heavy oil because the glass industry, they, they run their furnaces at 1,200, 1,300 degrees, which only a few oil, you know, fossil oil can do. So they are looking at alternative uh, fuels from biomass, uh, from uh, waste materials, and the government is giving them, you know, the funding they, they need to do this transition. They call it fuel switching, to switch from fossil fuel to uh, alternative fuels, uh, uh, even including hydrogen and ammonia. So it is the system, it, different countries have different systems, but the UK has this system of, you know, moving gradually and then getting the industry involved. Uh, you may have the same system here, but uh, 
I, I can't say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. One more question. No more. Lilian, it's time to coffee. Yeah, okay. Thank you, the participants of the round table. You are very nice. I have learned a lot about that. So I'm going to participate in round table uh, two weeks from now. So I have to talk about how you stock here. <laughs> Thank you so much. So let's go to the coffee. Thank you.